What do you think of if I say fly to a tropical beach destination? Probably palm trees, piña coladas, sunshine and white sand, I guess. What you probably didn't think of is unscheduled swimming exercise on final approach. This is exactly what happened to a Lion Air flight back in 2013. Let's find out what happened here. Welcome to airspace. On April 13th, 2013, a Boeing 737 operated by Lion Air, an Indonesian airline, was en route on its scheduled flight to Bali. The afternoon flight carried 109 souls to the holiday destination. While the two pilots, a 48-year-old captain and a 24-year-old first officer prepared for approach, they had to navigate through areas with large thunderstorms, as is typical for the climate at these latitudes. Let me add a short disclaimer here. I will be reconstructing parts of this flight, but unfortunately there is no usable 737 model yet for this flight simulator. So bear with me, as I will be using this generic Airbus A320 to illustrate the progress of this flight. The type of aircraft is not too important for this incident anyways. But now back to the flight at hand. As the pilots were navigating through the thunderstorms, they received information that at Bali the weather should be better. The weather report indicated light easterly winds, a cloud cover at 1700 feet but otherwise good visibility, and temperatures that were generally inviting to go for a good swim. After the flight had completed its arrival procedure, air traffic control cleared it for the VR approach to runway 09. This approach is a non-precision approach, that means that there is no vertical beam to guide the pilots down to the runway. Instead, the pilots rely on the airport navigation beacon to find the airport. To do so, a radial to the beacon is selected and tracked, while the vertical descent profile is planned and checked with distance measuring equipment. Using this technique, pilots can cross-check their distance to go until touchdown with their current altitude to see whether they are on the correct approach angle. For this approach, the young first officer was the pilot flying, while the captain handled the monitoring and communications. As the plane descended towards the runway and passed an altitude of 900 feet, the first officer remarked that he could not yet see the runway. Contrary to the weather report that the airport provided, rain showers had moved in from the south, battering the approach path with heavy rain. The rain was so dense that the first officer indeed could not see the airport. But his captain apparently thought he could. He stated that he had the approach lights inside and that the first officer should continue. At 550 feet above the ground, the ground proximity warning system indicated that the minimum had been reached. The minimum, or to be more specific, the minimum descent altitude, is the latest altitude at which the runway or the approach lights must be visible to the pilots in order that an approach may be continued. At this altitude, the first officer disconnected the autopilot and the automatic thrust control, but made no further comment. 15 seconds later, the cockpit voice recorder recorded ambient sounds that sounded like severe rainfall hitting the windshield. Six seconds later, the first officer had enough and handed controls to the captain, indicating that he could not see the runway. The captain took control and continued the approach. At this time, the airplane was just 150 feet above the ocean. Five seconds later, the radio altimeter started to count down the altitude above the ground below. 50, 40, 30, 20. Only when the automatic callout reached 20 did the captain finally act. He called for go-around, initiated the procedure, but it was too late. The 737 contacted the ocean surface in a shallow descent, since the inertia of the aircraft brought it low enough so the landing gear could touch the ocean. It was ripped off either due to collision with water or with the shallow reef just below the surface. The 737 came to rest, just next to the seawall before runway 09. Quickly, an evacuation was started as the aircraft was filling with water that entered mainly from the rear section of the aircraft. Almost all passengers evacuated through the overbring exit to the right and waited for rescue on the wing. Airport rescue services, as well as local police and residents responded to the emergency, with everything from lifeboats to surfboards from a nearby beach. Everyone on board made it out alive. The airport continued to operate for another 40 minutes until finally, the responsible persons decided to close the airport to be able to handle the emergency properly. The fact that everyone had made it out alive made the investigation a lot easier. Post-accident interviews conducted with the flight crew focused mainly on the question of why the pilots had continued the approach, despite the visual clues being clearly insufficient. The captain answered that he had thought he had indeed seen the approach lights from the point at which the aircraft had been at 900 feet already. He stated that he had seen a flashing light, which he assumed must have been part of the approach light system. The first officer later testified that he too had seen that light after the captain had mentioned it. 
Further, the captain explained that he saw a rain shower approaching from the right of the approach track. When he saw that the dark area of strong rain was rather narrow, he thought to himself that the shower could pass quickly after the aircraft would enter it. But when the two pilots then entered the area at about 300 feet above the ground, the environment became totally dark, a sensation that the captain stated he had never experienced before. Still, he pressed on. Seconds later, the first officer said he could no longer see the runway, so he handed controls to the captain. This would have been one of the many clues for the captain to go around and just try again a few minutes later. But the captain decided to continue the approach, despite the fact that both pilots had lost all visual reference. Only at 20 feet, in a position where normally the landing would be well underway, did the captain finally call for go around. According to Boeing's manuals, if a go around is initiated below 50 feet, a further descent of 30 feet must be anticipated due to inertia. Due to this, the aircraft hit the water just a second after his command as the engines were still spooling up. The crash at this point was unavoidable. It is really curious into how many traps this crew fell during their approach. There would have been so many opportunities to save the situation by simply going around. At 900 feet, when the first officer stated that he could not see the runway, the approach could have been continued to the minimum descent altitude, but latest there, a go-around should have been performed if the pilots didn't have sufficient visual clues. And even if they would have had visual contact there, when the first officer called out that he could not see anything at 150 feet above the ground, this should have been a severe red flag and the go-around should have been initiated immediately. To illustrate how badly heavy rain can deteriorate visibility, let me show you this short clip of a crew who did the right thing and went around from low altitude due to the complete loss of visibility due to a downpour. That would have been the way to do it for Lion Air 904 as well. Also, the investigation revealed that the blinking light that the captain had thought to be part of the approach light system was in fact not part of it. The approach light system had not been lit during daytime. The final report listed pilot error and poor crew resource management as the main factor of this accident, mainly the captain's decision to continue the approach at all costs. Unfortunately, so many pilots still do not use the possibility of a go-around, even though it would often be the better option. The investigators also commented that the weather reports issued by the airport of Bali were substandard, as aviation weather reports should not only include weather observations for the airport itself, but also for the area surrounding it, especially the approach paths. Additionally, the board also noted that the decision to continue to operate the airport even though there was an ongoing emergency response was not in accordance with international standards. Had another accident happened in the meantime, no emergency services would have been available for the second emergency. While the possibility of two emergencies happening at the same time is extremely low, this must still be considered. The aircraft was damaged beyond repair. At the time of the accident, it had only been two months old, but it was subsequently scrapped. And that was the story of Lion Air 904. If you liked this video, make sure to check out my other video about an aircraft who almost crashed in Portugal after flying aerobatics due to poor maintenance works. If you like the channel, please leave a like and consider subscribing. See you all in the next one.